boy, I tell you what, that was an interesting day in politics yesterday. Last thing I did before knocking off at nine o'clock was talk to Nicola Willis from the National Party, who said they would repeal the legislation that was before the House then, this tax, not on your KiwiSaver, but on the management fees that are received by people who manage KiwiSaver funds. The legislation was brought before the House, but it was literally gone by lunchtime. David Parker, the Minister of Revenue, announcing that, oh, we're not going to do that now. I tweeted yesterday that he might need to go to A&E to get treated for whiplash. That is one of the fastest policy flip-flops I have ever seen in nearly 40 years of covering uh, politics. So what happened and how bad was the idea in the first place? We're joined now by the ACT Party leader, David Seymour. David, welcome to the platform. That was pretty remarkable what happened yesterday. Oh, look, it's, it's really quite depressing for anyone who wants to see good policy making in a democracy, Sean. Um, not only the way the government put it forward, but also the response from most of New Zealand, frankly. Um, the starting point is we, we got to focus on good policy. You know, we've got real problems in New Zealand. We're on track to become a second world country. And uh, we can't afford to have this kind of level of debate that we've seen over the last 24 hours if we want to solve real problems. I want to clarify, were other parties or the parliament, through any process of presenting a draft bill, consulted about this policy before it was introduced? No, I mean, we, we weren't, although, to be fair, they did run a, uh, a process where they generated four options and talked to stakeholders in the industry. So, you know, it's not as though it came from nowhere. OK. Their excuse also seemed to be, oh, it's a great policy, but it's just going to be misinterpreted by people. Well, I, well, I think, you know, just to put cart on the table... Uh, I actually think the policy was sensible, and this is the level of debate we have to have. Uh, I know people, you know, won't necessarily want to hear it, but I think sometimes we should say these things. Uh, it was not a tax on your KiwiSaver. It was a tax on the people who administer KiwiSaver. It was a tax on goods and services. Now, if a hairdresser or a plumber have their goods and services taxed under GST, uh, why not the fund manager? That's, that's the fundamental question. And I think anyone who came at it from a fair-minded point of view would say, actually, yes, if we're going to have a GST, it should be applied as consistently and fairly as possible. The reason it went down so badly is that we have a government which is spending far too much, which is taxing far too much, which is wasteful in its use of public funds, has no direction and is gradually lowering the morale uh, of the New Zealand uh, uh, people uh, to a point where so many are considering leaving. Now, those are the real issues. Uh, the fact that everyone chose to focus on this particular one uh, instead of facing up to the real issues, uh, I think has been one of the really sad uh, sequences in democracy. Look, that's, I'm really interested by that position uh, y you take, David. So you're saying, actually, you think it was an OK policy, which kind of suggests that it was... The introduction, the spinning, the selling of the policy, which was woefully inadequate. Well, it, it, it starts before that. It's the environment in which they tried to introduce the policy. And the environment is a cost of living crisis, huge uncertainty and insecurity, uh, massive waste of government money, uh, and people worried about, you know, what's my future? How does my pension go down? How does, what does my retirement look like? Uh, and then you had a government that, without properly announcing it, without making the case, without I've done more to try and explain their policy than they have in the last 24 hours, uh, yeah. because I actually don't think it's a bad policy. Uh, so it starts with the environment, then the lack of, of explanation and trying to take people with them. But then, frankly, the response of some of the parties and the media, uh, which has been to just say, oh, it's bad, and ramp up the hyperbole, you know, we're not going to solve problems and become a more prosperous country with that standard of politics. Yeah, and it is polarised and it's blunt and it's unnuanced. David, would you re, if you were to, after the next election, be part of a government, would you want that government to revisit this policy? Well, in, a, in an ideal world, sure. I think, to be honest, in between the government that's currently trying to divide us along racial lines with co-governments and 
all the money that they're wasting and the fact that we have fewer and fewer kids going to school and almost got more kids doing ram raids than, than attending school right now, there'd, there'd probably be a few other priorities, to be honest. But in principle, yeah, I mean, if GST is a tax on goods and services, why should plumbers and hairdressers pay it but not bankers? Um, and that, I think there's a very reasonable question there. Mm. And then the next issue is, if you're worried about paying too much tax, let's deal with government waste and let's cut income tax. And, you know, that party takes this stuff seriously. We're the only party that's produced a fully costed alternative budget. We've shown how the, we'd give, you know, the average nurse 2300 bucks more of their own money each week, each year to keep. The thing about our policy is we wouldn't just give a hand out to one group. Actually, nurses would keep it, but so would firefighters and police officers and, and teachers and every other group that we're short of it right now. Mm. So, you know, we've, we've done the work on, on the bigger picture. Uh, and that's why I've just spent the last 24 hours, uh, you know, from just about all sides has been a disappointment for democracy and our ability to solve problems and become wealthier. Uh, the question it also begs, why don't they turn around and kibosh other unpopular policies like Three Waters? Well, exactly, and uh, the one positive that's come out of it is it shows that Labor can actually listen and get rid of a bad policy. I mean, they should get rid of the traffic light system yesterday. We should follow the Aussies and, uh, you know, shorten or ideally abolish our isolation periods. Um, and, uh, by the way, uh, while we're at it, why don't we stop dividing everyone into Tangata Whenua and Tangata Tiriti, because it mm. won't end well. David, have you got another two minutes? I know you've, you're on a schedule this morning. Oh, look, I always got time for the platform. OK, shoot. all right. Look, this has literally just come into us from immigration. And I know these issues of freedoms and transparencies are important to you. We now have confirmation from Immigration New Zealand that they were working with Interpol in Wellington to gather information about a visiting, and I'll use the term loosely, journalist to New Zealand who was turned away at the border on what appear to be increasingly spurious grounds because he didn't meet the bad character criteria as laid out in government policy. And this would tend to suggest a memo that was published on a website suggesting that Interpol actively went to Australia saying, we do not want this person here. We've got nothing bad on them. Could you find something for us? Do you think that is the way a government and an immigration department should act? Look, if, if it's as you're describing it, that a government department, beyond doing its job, is actively going out and looking for grounds to object to people with a political motivation, uh, that is absolutely wrong. If, if that's what's happened, uh, then that's completely wrong. Um, but you'll have to forgive me. I'm just, I'm just coming to. I'm just. Yeah, I, I get you. We will be, we'll be covering the story in more depth as it goes on. And police have not denied, or Interpol have not denied. Uh, the memo that was that was published saying we don't want this guy here. We got nothing on him. Could you please find something so we can turn him away? Hundred percent. All right. Hey, David. I thank you very much indeed for your time this morning. That is David Seymour, the leader of Act. And interesting, isn't it? So he actually says the policy wasn't such a dog, and I think quite rightly he says it wasn't going to tax your Kiwi save. It was going to tax the people who charge you the management fees for the KiwiSaver. And to a certain extent, in terms of equity and consistency across our tax system, it was a sustainable policy. But the way it was, if you like, dumped on the public, the way it was open to misinterpretation, and it's, well, maybe the PR spin around it was so incompetent that it was one of the quickest U-turns I've ever seen in policy political history. And I'm actually, maybe I'll, I'm, I'm going to be devil's advocate here. Why didn't David Parker just stick to his guns and explain the policy? Lord knows. Lord knows this government has often um, said it's so good at communication. Why didn't they haul in the great communicator just into return to sell the policy? And how come they can flip-flop on that, which isn't a bad policy so quickly, but three waters... They're not going to flip-flop on that, even though, wow, I think that's a way worse policy than this GST on KiwiSaver management, um, uh, management fees.